Hello, everybody, and welcome to Find My Pass from Home. It is Wednesday, July 28th, and we are very excited to be back uh, with the community again. Uh, I am Jen Baldwin. I am the North American Content Manager for Find My Past, uh, and I am also a genealogist, a very, very passionate genealogist. Um, I and I think many of you would agree, I love a good story. And today we're going to talk about the original genealogy community and the stories that they told. And I'm really excited for this one. So uh, as per usual, let us know where you're at and who you are and where you're uh, researching today and what you're up to. We do have Ellie in the comments. So thank you, Ellie. And hello, everybody say hello to Ellie. Uh, she is one of the most incredible and supportive people I have ever had the pleasure of working with. And I hope that all of you appreciate her efforts as well, because she is the one who makes all of this happen for us. Uh, so give a big shout to Ellie today. It just feels like a good day for a good shout out. Uh, <laughs> so um, let me know where you're at. William is here. Hello, William. It's always good to see you. Uh, Andrew is with us. Linda is here. Roz is here from Massachusetts where it's raining. Of course, give us your weather report. That's very important. Uh, we all want to know what's happening. Um, Claire is in Adderdale. Janet is in Wales. Um, let's see, Cheryl's in Ontario. Uh, Linda is with us today. Um, <laughs> I'm getting compliments already. That's very nice of you. Thank you. Ellen is with us in Roscoe, 26 degrees C with 89% humidity. I really don't know how you guys do it. Um, Jillian's in Edinburgh. Um, Daylene, and I hope I pronounced that right. Daylene is in Southwest Ohio. Um, thanks for joining us, Daylene. I have a great example for you today, actually. Uh, very relevant to your current location. Daphne's in Muggy, Somerset. Uh, Flo is in Oregon. Gosh, there's so many coming in. This is so great. Um, so uh, for... Um, oh, Daphne says, have I had my haircut? Yes, I did recently get my haircut. Thank you. Um, gosh, that's a nice way to start my day, guys. Thanks. It's only it's nine o'clock a.m. Uh, in Colorado. Um, so that's that's really lovely. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so, that's very nice. Um, so my weather report today, um, it is supposed to be around 101 today as the high in my town. Um Fahrenheit, of course, that is um, 38.3 Celsius. I looked it up, um, but it's a very dry heat. We don't really have a lot of humidity here. I technically live in an alpine desert, uh, so not a lot of humidity, um, probably less than 20%. So it sounds really hot and it is hot, don't get me wrong, um, but it's not hot and humid like so many other places in the world. So I always have sympathy for those people with really high humidity rates because I can't do it. I melt. Um, uh, Joan sang um, in the Pacific Northwest in Woodenville. A beautiful sunny day. That's fabulous. Thanks for being here, Joan. Uh, Linda's in Newark. Um, yeah, Andrew is working through last week's newspaper releases. Thank you very much, Andrew. Hope you found something exciting and fun. Um, so do share if you found something good uh, or anything, actually. I think it's all good, right? It's all good. Uh, Bonnie's in humid and hot Iowa. Gosh, that's, bro, I know that correcting me on the pronunciations in the UK, I, these are things that I practice. I really genuinely do. Uh, <laughs> but um, sometimes I just don't quite get it, uh, especially in the heat of the moment. I have to stop and think about these things. Uh, um, pronunciations. But if you guys try to pronounce some of the, the areas where I grew up, you know, you'd have to practice too. So it's, it's good. It's all good. All right. Today we are going to talk about the original genealogy community. And I know that that's kind of a vague name um, for a, a session today, but this is a piece of research that I think is probably the most underutilized perhaps in the field of family history. Um, and that's not just talking about recent, that's across time. Um, so it's, you know, I have a colleague, some of you may be familiar with, uh, his name is Kurt Witcher. He's the director of the Genealogy Center at the Allen County Public Library. And he did a lecture on this particular record collection a few years ago uh, that I had the pleasure of attending. I believe it was at a Roots Tech. And he said then, 
that um, up to 30% of possible family history content for us to utilize as researchers is included in these materials. Um, and so that's a third, right? A, a whopping third of the potential historical records that are available to us uh, are in this particular collection. And yet it gets very little use uh, across the family history community and always has so traditionally. So it's a big piece. Um, Definitely a big piece, and it's and it's an exciting one, and it's one that can bring a lot of stories to life. Um, so I hope that you all enjoy this little little journey um, through this particular collection and and the original community. So with that, let me go ahead and share my slides. Um, so we are going to talk about the original genealogy community, uh, and then what I'm hoping is that many of you will, as we progress through today, you will be um, on the Find My Past website exploring this as we work through uh, and sharing your stories. But by all means, share questions. So if anything happens that you, you know, that I cover that you don't quite understand or um, doesn't make sense you know, please, please, please flag it so that um, so that we can answer all the questions that happen um, right here live. That's what I'm here for. And I'd love to see that happen. So let me just get my I'm trying to get my mouse to cooperate. Here we go. OK. All right. So I'm going to start by taking us through a little bit of memory lane, right? The original genealogy community. What do I mean by that? Well, let's think back. 20, 30 years ago to what genealogy was like before the internet. And, and yes, I know I look very young, but I have been researching long enough to actually have firsthand experience of all of this, I promise. Uh, <laughs> um, I remember before the internet very, very well. I remember getting started with my grandmother. Um, and I remember actually going into a room that looked an awful lot like this one. I'm pretty sure it had the same carpet. Uh, and sitting kind of in the corner uh, as my grandma attended a genealogy society meeting. Uh, and I do, I picked this picture because it is so similar to what I experienced as a child. There was the big table in the center. I know that's not how most societies do it now, but this is just so similar to what I have in my, in my memory core um, of that one meeting I attended with grandma. Uh, now, Grandma didn't participate very much, um, and she kind of sat me in the corner with um, a coloring book and some crayons, and I think I was around 12 or 13, and so I was a little insulted by the coloring book and the crayons. Um, so I didn't really color. I sat and listened, and the thing that stuck with me was how much they helped each other, right? All the people in the room talking to each other about their stories, their research, letters they had written, right? Different ways and means of communicating with archives around the country and around the world. Uh, and, and I was in awe of this group of people who had come together just to talk about family history. Um, this was in the very early stages of my own journey into family history. And it wasn't long after this that Grandma and I started visiting cemeteries and doing some other activities together. Uh, and and that's really how I got to where I am today, um, is because of Grandma's influence. So this this has a real personal connection to me, but I think it probably has a real personal connection to just about all of us, right? We all got started somehow. Uh, and the ability to go into a room and talk to other people, COVID aside, uh, about our experiences as, as researchers, um, people who aren't going to roll their eyes, who are going to be just as excited about we are about our discoveries uh, and our finds, right? This is so important. And this is such an important part of the experience of a researcher and always has been, right? Always has been. I mean, societies have been around for, in some cases, 100, 150 years uh, and still going strong, thank goodness. Um, and these organizations are so crucial to what we do, all of us. Now, there are a lot of other things that come to mind when we talk about that original community and life before the internet. Um, should I jog your memory a little bit with these two beauties, right? Um, you know, how many of us had that set of encyclopedias that was well-loved and used? Uh, I remember putting a little 
pieces of paper all over my parents' set of encyclopedias. And at one point I was sitting there with a highlighter ready on an entry that I was reading. And my mom stopped me. She's like, no, mm -mm, no highlighters in the encyclopedia. <laughs> she wasn't happy with me. Um, but, you know, going to the libraries, utilizing the card catalogs, understanding the reference materials on the reference shelf, right? These were all very, very typical activities. And in many cases, they still are. I've, I've been to a couple of libraries, not during COVID, obviously, but before that, they still have very active card catalogs, uh, or, and at least subject catalogs like this on the on the card system. Um, so, it's you know it's a fantastic way to research, right? Because you're you're in that moment, you're in the experience, and it's not just another day online. I didn't think twice about grabbing an encyclopedia when I was when I was young. Uh, and I definitely actually still have some of those types of reference materials today, right on my shelves um, that I don't necessarily need anymore. I could duplicate that on the internet, but sometimes a good book is just worth it. So all of this comes from and created that environment of that original community. Um, I'm kind of trying to keep my eye on the comments as well. Uh, and Tina's talking about her, uh oh, there we go. This one. I love this. Tina, thank you. My grandmother got an old typewriter with a red and black ribbon and had me type all her notes. I learned so much and still use some of them as I'm now the family protector of the history. Yeah, this is a beautiful memory, but it, it sparked in you, obviously, Tina, something really exciting. Um, and it's just fabulous, right? So this, all of this comes from and creates this wonderful um, community that we have had established in the world of genealogy for so many decades. Uh, it's just, um, it's just fun to kind of think about where we've come from as a community, right? And speaking of typewriters, of course, I had to include that because part of the original genealogy community is in fact, sitting down and typing out those articles, writing letters to each other and saying, do you know something about this? And I think you might know something. I think you might be a relation. And do we have this surname in common? Uh, this letter was written to me as recent. I think the date is 2005. It's still in my collection. It's one that I hold on to because the information she provided is valuable to me. Uh, these types of activities, right, all made up what that original community was all about. And one of the really important things about that original community was that they had to share with each other. It was essential that they shared. It's still essential today. But without that sharing concept, without the idea of spreading information, not just around your local society, but nationally or even internationally, using that typewriter to write articles, to um, uh, draft a story, to index materials, right? If the local society going out to the cemetery and transcribing a bunch of headstones, all of that had to be shared and it all had to be accessible somewhere. And that's the source that I wanna talk to you about today is the paper trail that the original community actually left behind for us. And in fact, a paper trail that's still being created today. And that paper trail can be consumed in one simple concept, right? Genealogy publications. Almost every society has some kind of publication. Almost every organization did some kind of newsletter or journal or um you know, record book of some kind, right? And every society, a nonprofit, a club, an organization, any kind of group who got together, they had some way of communicating with each other. And most only publish those records to their members, right? Membership granted you the, and still does in many cases, grants you the ability to, to receive that publication, whether it's in your mailbox or your inbox, uh, either way. And those publications are full of incredibly valuable information. This is the third of content that's available to us as researchers that Kurt Witcher was talking about that inspired me to use this record set so many years ago at Rootstack. So if you have all of these wonderful publications and you have all of these people around the world who saying, we have some wonderful stories and we wanna share them and we wanna write them, how do you actually get to them? And the answer to that question is the periodical source index. 
It is um, commonly referred to as PERSI, which is the acronym. Um, but that's what we want to talk about today. PERSI provides organizations around the world the ability to share their materials. All right, I'm going to pause for just a second because Matthew is commenting that the picture is really unclear um, and he can't read anything. So if someone else could comment, if you're having picture issues on the video, uh, I would love to know if this is a problem across the board for the broadcast or if it is just a single issue, perhaps. Okay, William says it's fine for him. So I'm going to keep going. Ruth says she can see fine. Okay, great. Thank you very much, everybody. Appreciate that. I just wanted to make sure that it was it was good. So, Ed, and we have Betty Ann on YouTube saying it's clear. Okay, good, cool. All right. Thank you very much. So, let's pick that back up. So, we're talking about Percy, of course, a periodical source index, which is currently hosted on Find My Past. Now, Percy has had a number of variations. Um, it's been historically done in a number of different ways. And we're, I'm actually going to show you one of those as well. So these society publications become really valuable, right? We share content. But if you're not a member of that particular organization, how do you get it, right? How do you see that content? How do you read that story? And Percy is really the answer. A lot of us have these collections, these newsletters sitting around at home. Um, it is invaluable to get research shared by other members of the community, right? This is a copy. I have a, a, a number of copies of Family History Capers. It's from an orga uh, um, organization out of uh, Michigan. And right on the cover page, it kind of gives you the clue that we all need, right? Indexed in Periodical Source Index, or PERSI, published by the Washtenaw County Genealogical Society, the Genealogical Society of Washtenaw County. These materials, I can't even begin to describe how valuable they are. If you've not used PERSI or um, the publications of societies from around the world, Really, 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 you should start doing that. I would argue that they are just as valuable, if not sometimes more valuable than even newspapers. Uh, the materials that are found within these pages are absolutely amazing. And if it weren't for the community, we wouldn't have any of this, right? These are individual researchers here, just like you and me, sharing their materials, sharing their stories, their discoveries, but also sharing the challenges, sharing that you know, this courthouse burned down during the American Civil War, and so we lost this list of records. Or here's a set of transcriptions that was copied down in 1822 and preserved in this publication. And who knows where those historical, those original records are today, right? The, there's just so much vast information in these pages that it's really, really hard to say you could, you could do a thorough research project without using them. So let me give you a couple examples. Historically, Percy was an annual volume that was published in book form. Um, and I actually have one just, and that's what this, this picture is out of. Um, I have it sitting next to me. I kind of bought it on a whim just because I really love Percy and it was kind of just a thing to have, right? Um, I don't really use it very much, but I like the idea that I have one of the volumes. This one happens to be from 1986. And in the 1986 entries, there are a number of publications, of course, from all over the world. This one, this snippet happens to be England. Um, and look at all the different varieties of topics that you have in the entries they recorded in 1986, right? These are just the materials they added that year. So you've got parish relief for bastards. You've got um, more on Highgate Cemetery, a selection of Irish or lists, British military, um, et cetera, et cetera. Society of Genealogists from 1911 to 1986. And then those three down at the bottom really caught my attention because they sound absolutely fascinating, right? Tudor civil servants, naughty Elizabethans, a 19th century diary that was um, theoretically discovered and, and discussed and written about. These are all fascinating topics and have absolute relevance to our research today, right? We need these materials um, and they're exciting materials. Um, so let's back up for a second. Before I start to show you some of the records, um, 
let's talk a little bit more about the details of what Percy actually is, right? So again, available on Find My Past, um, and you can access it through the Search All Records menu uh, by typing in periodical, the whole word, or you can use it in the newspapers section of the site, uh, the newspaper drop down. Oh, Matthew went over to YouTube and he's got a better picture now. That's really good. I'm glad, Matthew. Thank you for staying with us. Percy is um, a subject-based index. So most of us are really used to searching for names in historical records. Percy is not necessarily a name index. The only time you're going to find it indexed by name is if the article is about three families or less. So if you find an article that says, um, the life story of Oscar F. Brown of Colfax County, Nebraska, it's going to be indexed with his name. But if you find an article that says veterans um, from the American Civil War in Colfax County, Nebraska, it's probably not going to be indexed with Oscar's name in the index. Now, he was a veteran. He might even be named in the article, but the article is about a bigger topic and Oscar's just a little part of that. So it's a subject-based index. So keep that in mind. You're not searching for names, you're searching for context. So um, some of the examples I use often are things like various religions, right? What do you need to know about the Shakers? Um, there's a whole publication on um, the Friends, the Society of Friends that they published. So if you're looking for historical context about your Quaker ancestors, do you want and need to read that publication? Yeah, I would think that you would want and need to do that. Um, and it goes back, you know, a significant amount of time. Uh, there are articles about uh, just about everything. Um, so military, history, um, general organizations, um, uh, fraternal societies, for example, just about anything you can think of. I have yet to, to think of a topic that I have not been able to find in Percy somehow. So that's your challenge number one for the day, is try to come up with a topic that you can't find in Percy. Um, I, it might be a little, little bit less um, uh, coverage for those of you in the UK, uh, and I'll recognize that. There's not as many publications in the UK and other kind of English-speaking uh, countries across the world. Certainly, the vast majority of it is North America, but they are steadily increasing the number of materials for international territories. So it's, it's a, but even with that, you're going to find materials that are about the UK or the population of the UK that are written in publications in New York or Iowa or Florida. So even though you may not see a publication for your area, you may still find an article about your area. Um, Audrey said that she is baking lemon and coconut tarts. And I'm just going to pause for a second and acknowledge that. First of all, uh, I really would like one. Thank you, Audrey. Um, <laughs> uh, she said last week's cherry bakewells were very well received in the office. I'm quite jealous. I haven't been able to do any baking for a while. It's been really hot. I haven't really wanted to. That sounds amazing and delicious. And now I'm ready for some breakfast. So uh, I probably should have eaten before I started this session. <laughs> Breakfast is good. Joan asks, how about New Zealand and Australia? Yes, absolutely. Uh, there are publications that are based in both New Zealand and Australia that are available in Percy, but again, articles from all over the world about topics in New Zealand and Australia. Um, I really have not ever found a, a country um, that has a, a large enough population to have a society that, that doesn't have something relevant in Percy. So on Find My Past, you can search uh, the Percy Index for free, um, but then of course you would need to register or even possibly do a subscription for any of the details, but you can see the kinds of content um, I'm talking about uh, if you just do a simple search, if you're logged in. And in some cases, we actually have the images of the digitized publication. That's not true 100% across the board of the collection. The Percy Index is well over 6,000 publishers at this point. Uh, and that's a lot of people to contact and ask for permission to get their, their permission to publish the images. Uh, so it's ongoing efforts um, to keep everything up to date. But, um, but by and large, there's a, there's a vast majority of, or I can't say majority because I don't know the numbers off the top of my head. Uh, there's a large piece of the the index that does have images attached. 
Audrey promises that she's going to bring me cake next time she sees me. I can, I know I keep going back to this, but um, it really does sound good. So I'm going to hold you to that, Audrey, for sure. <laughs> so let's take a look at what I'm, what I'm talking about when I say that you can find content for just about everywhere. This is one of my favorite examples. Um, so this is a record transcription from Percy. Uh, the article in question that I that I'm interested in is um, right here at the top. It says it's a it's an article about pay certificates from 1780 to 81 for the New York militia. And I suspect that one of my ancestors was involved in the New York militia during the Revolutionary War, and this covers some of that period. And so this article is of great interest to me. The ironic part, and the part that I think is kind of eye-opening, is that this was published by the Seattle Genealogical Society on the other side of the United States, right? This is Washington State, not D.C. Um, so how would I know as an individual to go to the Seattle Genealogical Society to find an article about the New York militia, right? I wouldn't if it weren't for Percy. And the reason I want to call this the original genealogy community is because it took hundreds of thousands of people around the world over the course of the last hundred years to create these materials, right? When we talk about the community, um, especially at Find My Past, I can't speak for any of the other companies, but at Find My Past, genealogy community is absolutely essential to success for all of us, right? Um, not just this format, right? Not just these Facebook sessions and these live streams, but in everything we do, the community is absolutely essential. At Find My Past, we really believe, and I know that all of you believe, that the community really matters. And you can see it played out in these publications. These are labors of love, right? No one, very few people are actually paid to do genealogy in this world. Um, and that's been true historically as well. So you have all of these independent researchers, all these guys out there that are writing these, these materials, these articles, doing this research and sharing it just because of a sense of community, a sense of sharing. And I think that's just amazing. The community matters today. That's true today. It was true 40 years ago, and it'll be true 100 years from now. Um, that will never end. And I think that's one of the really amazing things about, about family history. All right. So what kind of content might you find in Percy? I'm going to try and step off my community soapbox, but it's something that I, I feel very, very passionately about. Um, the types of materials really vary. So in a matter of an hour, I found all three of these articles uh, while I was prepping these slides for today. So we have a sketch of William Biddle and Thomas Biddle, um, an article from the Jewish Historical Society publications called The Cincinnati Community in 1825. So discussing Jewish, the Jewish community in Cincinnati in 1825. And then place names of Essex County. Right. All of those are readily available to, available to me by using Percy and the search um, functionality behind the index. So it's a really, really powerful tool. You just don't know what you're going to come up with. Um, I was surprised yesterday, I actually was working through some materials. I am looking for an ancestor that I, according to oral history, was a um, traveling Methodist minister in upstate New York quite early on, right after the Civil War um, in New York history. And I discovered, although this isn't about New York, I did discover an article about Methodist circuits in Indiana in 1811, which is also quite early in Indiana history. So I haven't even read this whole article yet, but one of the things that caught my eye is that within the pages of this article, and you guys will all, if you have heard me before, you'll get a kick out of this because it included maps. And so I just couldn't resist, absolutely could not resist uh, reading this article and saving it in my account so that I could go back to it again because maps, you guys, maps. You just find everything in the Percy platform. Um, photographs, historical sketches, maps, obviously. I, there's just so much to go through. And of course, let's not forget that the community also contributed in terms of preserving records for us, right? How many of us have participated in a society project where we transcribed headstones or we, um, you know, it went to an archive and tried to document everything that was in that, that little archive or that museum. I've done that a number of times in my local community. And of course, genealogists have been doing that for years, right? So here's a, um, 
a page from the 1947 New York Genealogical and Biographical Record in which they're they have transcribed records um, from um, the Trinity Church, right, right in, in Manhattan, um, the Trinity Church Parish, and they're transcribing the marriage records. So what you see is a transcription of the 1793 original parish records. I, I don't know for sure if 1793 original parish marriage records still exist today, but I do know that I at least have a transcription of them um, thanks to volunteers in the community that published their work in the record back in 1947. So really, really fascinating material. Now, these are all kind of abstract examples. Let me give you a much more specific example. So here's one of my ancestors, and you may have heard about him before if you've been on Find My Past From Home with me before, but William Clark Davis. Uh, he was born in Ohio in 1817. He died in Huntsville, Alabama in 1900. He was actually killed in an accident with a horse. His uh, body was taken back to Dayton, Ohio and buried there. So he's in one of the larger cemeteries in Ohio. He's he owned and managed several foundries in Dayton and Cincinnati during the course of his business. He was incredibly successful. So he eventually, later in life, starts to also get into land sales and land transactions just over the river uh, into Tennessee from, from Cincinnati. So he leaves a pretty large estate. And he only has three children that survive into adulthood. Most of the estate actually goes to his spinster daughter who never married and never had children um, because he had given his other sons lots of money already. Uh, and that's what it actually says in his will. Um, I've already supported you during my lifetime. Now I'm going to make sure that my daughter who doesn't have a husband is going to be set for the rest of her life. So he's an interesting character in my tree for sure. I'm quite fascinated with William. Early in my research, of course, I looked and found his obituary, and it's quite long, and there are numerous versions of his obituary. This one in particular is from the Dayton Herald, again from 1900. And it's got all sorts of great information in it that I could pursue and use Percy for, but the one... Oh, Kathy, you're right. Excuse me. It wasn't Tennessee. It's Kentucky. I'm terribly sorry. You're absolutely correct. He was in Kentucky, not Tennessee. See, I'm just trying to do this too fast. All right. So the one thing about his obituary that uh, that really caught my eye uh, very much, especially for a tool like Percy, is down here at the bottom. It says the Gypsy tribe of Stanleys soon recognized his sterling qualities as a friend. He was for some years their trusted treasurer and advisor. Now, I will admit that when I read this for the first time, I literally jumped out of my chair and threw my fist up in the air and I might have even screamed a little uh, because this is one of the most exciting uh, historical research opportunities I think I have ever uncovered, not just in my family, but in any family I've ever worked on. I was just absolutely enthralled with the idea of my wealthy millionaire ancestor somehow becoming entangled in this tribe, this community of people. Um, <laughs> so it, it was just an incredible moment for me. And I know that many of you have had moments like that yourself, right? This was just mind blowing. How does this connection problem, does this, does this happen? Right. And what can I possibly uncover about this? Because of course, you know, the first thing I think of is something along these lines, right? I mean, might be kind of stereotypical of me. Um, but this is an image from the era. It's dated pre 1924. It's from the public library of Cincinnati in Hamilton County. And it is labeled as a gypsy camp near Carthage, which is um, in Ohio. And so this is kind of, you know, the vision I had in my head. And I'm trying to picture how my millionaire ancestor uh, is becoming involved with a community like this, right? So of course, I turn to Percy because I'm trying to learn about this uh, particular part of my ancestor's life. In Percy, I limited my search to um, just referencing Ohio. And then I simply just searched for the keyword of gypsy, which of course would have been appropriate terminology um, for historical documentations, right? We might not say gypsy today, um, but uh, if we're thinking historically, we need to use the terminology of the time. And so I, I found this search 
I um, got 14 hits back, all of which were interesting, um, most of, of which were relevant. There was even one that allowed me to understand uh, family terminology in the Romani language. Um, there's an article in Percy about that. So it tells me, um, you know, how they, what words they use for mother, father, grandfather, grandmother, uh, cousin, aunt, uncle, etc. So if I were to ever find any written records, uh, I would be able to identify those terms uh, quite easily, which I think is fantastic. But the one I decided to share as an example today is from um, the Family Tree publication, also called the New Zealand Family Tree. And again, that's Ohio, not New Zealand, New Zealand. Um, but the article title is Stories and Obituaries of the Montgomery County Gypsies. And I thought, okay, this is perfect. It was written by a librarian in Dayton, Ohio, a number of years ago, back in 2012. Uh, and it is basically a summary of the available resources for this com this traveling community. Little did I know that Dayton, Ohio is actually the national capital uh, for gypsies here in the United States. So here's my ancestor in Dayton, right in the thick of things, right? Uh, and so this librarian had written this article. Now, uh, I immediately recognized that the article was going to be important because not only did it provide information for me, but it also gave me a little bit of background on the tribes or the clan that was in the area. Also gave me various ter uh, terms, different terminology to use in my research, which has proven to be extremely helpful. Uh, and again, all of this happens because of Percy right? But when I finally do get my hands on the article, this one I had to actually send a request off for uh, and get a copy of, um, what I realized really quickly is actually in the very first couple of paragraphs of the material um, beyond this kind of introductory content, um, it states uh, that um, the camping place uh, for the local Stanley tribe, um, was at one time not far from Fairfield on what was known as the Jack Frick Farm, then on the Davis Farm in Montgomery County. So again, I got pretty excited about this because my ancestor's name is Davis. I went back to uh, reality for a second. I looked at the 1850, the 1860 U.S. federal censuses uh, and any of the other land and property records that I could get a hold of. And found that actually my ancestor was the only one in the area that really could have said that he had a farm. There were no other farms owned by a Davis family in the area at that time. So my, my conclusion is that this is in fact William Clark Davis and his family. And he is not only a trusted advisor and treasurer, according to his obituary, he's also letting them camp on his land. So there's definitely a story here, right? And again, I wouldn't know any of this without using Percy as a research tool. Now, of course, the community plays a huge part in this, right? I wouldn't have this article if it weren't for that librarian in Dayton. And I wouldn't have the article if it weren't for the Genealogy Society publishing their publication. And I wouldn't have this article if the Allen County Public Library in Fort Wayne, Indiana, did not create the index in the first place and spend countless hours and countless people uh, working through every single article in every publication in their collection and creating an index entry. This is 100% the genealogy community at its best. And I'm grateful for every single one of those individuals. <laughs> um, I wouldn't know any of this without the community, right? And of course, community has much more to offer us than just historical records and um, snippets and transcriptions of records. They offer us motivation. They offer us friendship. They offer us uh, collaboration opportunities. Uh, so this article from the New Zealand genealogist uh, from 2008 by Jeanette Grant, um, she tells this very intriguing story of her search um, on the family of her husband. And the title says it all, right? It pays to keep looking. I won't offer any spoilers on how this turned out. Uh, I would encourage you to go into the Find My Past collection and look up this article from the New Zealand genealogist because it's a great story uh, and it's a really, really fantastic piece of research. And it is inspiring, right? It is motivating to hear about other people's successes. So again, I would go back simply to saying, our community matters for so much, right? We get motivation from each other. We get records from each other. 
I know there's a handful of people I could message right now and say, I need help with this question. And they would be there in an instant. I know that I could go to the Find My Past forum page on Facebook and do the exact same thing. And I would have a dozen people saying, have you tried this? Community is so important in the field of family history research. Um, it's really, really essential. So I'm just going to finish with, and then we're going to look at questions and things um, and comments. I'm going to finish that we're better together, right? Every time you take a moment to share a, a story or a discovery, make a suggestion, give a little bit of advice, or just simply offer a positive encouragement or a thumbs up on Facebook, that community spirit is, is carried forward, right? We're, we're taking one step forward. And I think actually that it was said really well by one of our, our community members, Debs, who sh she said, shared with us a few weeks ago, my fave thing about Find My Past is the amazingly warm and helpful community and staff. And that's all of you guys. And that's incredible. So as much as I wanted to talk about Percy today, I also wanted to talk about that kind of, a, and that original, you know, family history community, that original society. I also just want to emphasize that none of this would happen without all of you. Um, so we have these incredible records from societies across the world and throughout history as, fam as researchers. Uh, the genealogy community has been going strong for a long time and will continue to go strong. Uh, so it is an essential tool in your toolkit. It's available on Find My Past. Ellie shared the links if you want to look at it. Um, and I'm going to scroll through the comments and see if there's questions, but I, and I'm really going to stop trying to get, I, I'm really going to try to get off my, my soapbox, but I just, as you can tell, I feel very strongly about the tools that are provided to us by the community itself. Okay. So, um, do, do, do. oh, Ellen, I saw your comment early on retired library worker here. Love Percy. Percy is definitely more well known in the library community, especially in the United States than I think any other part of the family history community. Librarians absolutely utilize Percy uh, a lot. Um, so thank you, Ellen. I appreciate that um, very much. Uh, let's see. Okay, here's a great comment from Andrew, the Lancashire I think I got that right. Parish Register Society have been publishing excellent transcripts since 1898 and other counties have similar organizations. That's exactly what I'm talking about, Andrew. Those transcripts are massively important, right? What if they transcribe something and then the next day the parish burns down or the church or the archive is destroyed and those records are lost? It's just an incredible resource um, to think about um, how much they have offered us. Um, we had a whole conversation about cake and Audrey's baking. So that's really good. Um, do, do, do. <laughs> um, let's see more things about cake. That's good. Um, <laughs> let's see. Let's see. Janine, I think that's right, Janine. Someone in colonial Pennsylvania in 1778 had two children, a boy and a girl, who were adopted. Their birth parents lost to time. The boy was my four times great grandfather, John Fitzgerald Charles. I have been looking for his birth parents for six years and will continue until I find them. That's determination for you. That sounds about right. I've been, uh, genetic genealogy says the father was a Murphy from the Berea, Berea Peninsula, Peninsula in West County Cork. I'm not familiar with that one. Um, maybe Percy can help. I would say Percy can help. Um, here, just from this snippet, what you've told us, I would look in Percy for obviously Pennsylvania birth records, um, any kind of vital transcripts or religious records from Pennsylvania in 1778. I would also, obviously, you're right in the middle of the Revolutionary War period. So I would look for references to Pennsylvania in that period, which there's going to be a lot of. So you might have, if you have any military information, um, uh, if he was involved at all, or if you think the father was involved, or if you think the Murphys were involved, um, you might want to look, you know, kind of narrow down that search a bit. Um, I would definitely look for the, the children. So look in Percy for information about John Fitzgerald Charles and his life, where he lived, his occupation, um, if he was involved in maybe the War of 1812, because Roughly, he would have been about the right age. Um, all of that type of information, any of those sources might lead you back to the parents. Um, 
certainly the Murphys, the Murphy surname itself, um, I would be looking at in terms of Percy. There's lots of lineage societies and surname societies that have publications like this. I would be looking for information about County Cork and that particular peninsula. Uh, uh, there's a number of different avenues you could take with this, just this one little snippet of information. Um, what do we got? Four or five sentences here. There's, there's a lot that you might be able to find. And look, none of these articles, they, they may not ever mention your ancestors specifically, but they will give you the contextual information you need to understand the time period and the area geographically better. Also look at, of course, the citations, right? These articles are written by people like you and me, and they had to get their information somewhere as well. So follow the citations of the author to see if that leads to original records, parish records, uh, Bible records, anything like that, that might actually give you a very, you know, much more specific genealogical record um, of your of your ancestor. Um, okay. Oh, I love this. This is great. Janet, this is a great comment. Information about ancestors can come from the most unlikely sources. Even a comment on the television can start a line of research. A hundred percent. Yeah, I do a lot of reading. I listen to podcasts uh, and I'm constantly making notes about, oh, I got to check that. Maybe that's a thing. Um, so yeah, a hundred percent. Absolutely agree. Oh, Andrew, thank you, Andrew. Your soapbox is fascinating. Don't fall off it. I, all right, good. I will keep going. I've been very passionate about societies for a number of years, and um, it's it's exciting. Okay. Um, oh, okay. This is good. Beth, now getting easier to say who isn't related or connected to Miko. Absolutely. That's fantastic. Michelle wants to know, this is a good question, how do you see the actual article or publication? So the answer to that, Michelle, is it depends. Like I mentioned, in some cases, uh, the images of the publication are available on Find My Past and it's attached to the tr transcription and you can go straight into the publication and read it from cover to cover. Um, but there are many instances in which uh, the publication is not available online and there's a number of reasons for that. But the easiest way to get a copy of the article is actually to just to email the society that published it in the first place, um, right? So I have copies of um, Family History Capers, right, from, uh, from Michigan. Um, and I got these because I joined the society and they have them available on their website. And I was able to print um, the ones that were relevant to my research, right? So joining the society might help, but you could also contact the society and say, hey, I would like a copy of this specific article. Um, how, how can I achieve that? Some of them may charge you for it, but in most cases, if it's just for one article, they're probably not going to. That's been my experience. The alternate option is to contact the Allen County Public Library itself, the Genealogy Center. They have a copy service that they provide for Percy. And I think you can order, if I remember right, up to seven or eight articles at a time for a pretty nominal fee. It was not very much, uh, less than $10 US. Um, and you would get all of those copies kind of at one time. So if you're ordering through Allen County Public Library, try to find a number of articles that you're interested in and submit a full request all at once. So you pay the fee for all of them instead of paying the fee for each of them individually. So try to fill up that form as much as you can. And information, the form is actually available in the Find My Past system. So if you find an article you're interested in, you go to the transcription. If you scroll down in that material, that context there on the site, um, you'll find a link to the form and, and to the Allen County Public Library website that you need to, um, to get a copy of that particular article. Okay, let's see. <laughs> Too many... Um, Lots of jokes about Miko, and I, I love it. I'm here for it all day. Uh, Beth says, and this is great, Beth is part of my soapbox, right? Local knowledge can be so useful. Uh, most people love picking their brains. You never stop learning, and that's absolutely correct. You know, um, I know plenty about the history of the town I live in. I don't have any ancestors here at all. We've only been here, we've been here less than a decade. Um, but I'm always learning something new, right, about my community. So um, yeah, that local knowledge, those local societies are absolutely so important. Bobby, your first time with us. Thank you so much for joining us. We love having you as part of our community. Um, she just happened to come across it and we're very pleased that you did. Um, 
I know there's some comments on the travelers communities as I used as my, my example. So thank you for those. If you know anything about Ohio uh, Romanies or gypsies, I would love to talk to you because information is tough to come by. Um, Audrey, absolutely. I have written some blog posts on the National Archives site about interesting finds in our records and descendants or relatives of the people concerned have added extra details in the blog comments. And that's a really good point because as much as we rely on published works from societies throughout the history of that organization, many of them are now moving into, of course, a digital format. And so Percy is a wonderful tool, but you also should be looking at the society website. Um, in this case, uh, it's not a society, it's the National Archives, which is a good example. But the comments that you see left on society websites, the interaction of members um, being a part of their email update list, perhaps, is an option um, for research in that area, right? So keep that in mind. You always, 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 always want to go to the society for the local area in which you're working and connect with them in some way, whether it's membership or something else, so that you can take advantage of their knowledge and their depth. Um, uh, there are the experts in their area, for sure. Um, do, do, do. Okay, let's see. Oh my goodness, this is amazing. Susanna has just found the photo of one of her husband's relations, her first time using Percy, and a big thank you. That's incredible. Susanna, congratulations. That's amazing. I love it when people make discoveries. I love it even more when they make them through Percy. Um, that's fabulous. Congratulations. Yay, well done, Susanna. Um, please post a um, a if you if you want to um, post the story and maybe even um, uh, the picture in the Find My Past forum, so we can all celebrate with you because that's awesome. Um, all right, very good. Um, Family History Fanatics is with us. Thank you very much, a big supporter and a partner uh, here in the United States. If you haven't looked at Family History Fanatics, I highly recommend it. And she gave me a nice compliment too. So that's nice. Thank you very much, <laughs> Devin, for being with us. Um, fabulous. They've got a great YouTube channel. So definitely check that out. Um, let's see. The National Archives website is wonderful. Matthew, I couldn't agree more. Uh, I use it almost every single day. Absolutely fascinable, fascinating and um, invaluable. Um, oh, this is a good one. I love this because I am really fascinated with uh, science and genealogy as well. Um, Amy says there's a publication on Krakatoa eruption and earthquake from 1883. I love geology and history coming together. It's one of the things that got me into history. Um, yeah, I, I 100%. Like all of this, right? There's so many aspects to our family history that we don't think about and, and we don't take into consideration. But these articles can just open your eye. Like be ready to spend hours in this collection. I'm not kidding. Because like even just preparing, you know, 30 slides for today, I was, I mean, it took me two days because it was just like, I want to keep going. I want to keep going. Karen also makes a good point for our organizations today. Local family history societies often have a Facebook group or a Twitter account. It's a good way to reach out to the community. Absolutely agree. We're all on social media any way we might as well use it for our organizations and our societies 100%. Audrey comments again. Thank you, Audrey. The ACPL. And again, for those of you unfamiliar with the acronym, that's the Allen County Public Library in Fort Wayne, Indiana. It's the largest public genealogy library in the United States. And that may be a confusing statement because most of us go, well, the Family History Library in Salt Lake is the largest genealogy library. And that's true. Um, but it is the largest private library. The Allen County Public Library is a public library uh, for those familiar with the U.S. library system. Uh, and so they have the bragging rights of saying that the largest public genealogy library in the country, which is great. And they're fantastic people, wonderful staff, incredibly helpful, incredibly knowledgeable, wonderful researchers. So many good colleagues and friends have come out of ACPL. Anyway, let me get back to Audrey's comment. Uh, they have a large quantity of UK family history journal journals. I helped box them up to be sent there. That's great. Normally would suggest the Society of Genealogists who have been the who have the best collection of journals, but their collection will be in storage for the next few months. So if you're looking for a journal from uh, one of the UK family history organizations, 
Uh, by all means, check ACPL. And of course, you can do that through the Percy Index on Find My Past, or you can do it through the Allen County Public Library um, catalog, right? So either route. And of course, both are online and available to you. Okay. Um, do, do, do family history fanatics. Devin saying genealogy plus historical context is so fun. A hundred percent. Yes. Um, I could talk about historical context all day long. Um, let's see. Oh, yep. Yeah, another great suggestion. Anyone with British ancestors should look at the British History Online website. There is lots there. That's true. Uh, another great website. And yes, this one, Percy plus JSTOR. Oh, man. I, yes, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, and if you're not familiar with JSTOR, it's another one I highly recommend you just Google um, and and get used to it, get, get started with it. Available in most major libraries if you don't want to pay for a subscription, but they have free access to materials as well. Um, so yeah, yeah, for sure. We could talk all day about publications like this. Okay. Uh, we just have about five minutes left. So I want to make sure if anybody had any specific questions about Percy, please drop them in the comments. Um, now is your chance. But of course, you can always reach out to us at support at findmypast.com um, or on our social media channels. Uh, that question would probably be redirected to me anyway. Uh, so I'm happy to answer those questions. I spent all day in Percy. And if a customer asks me to, then it's then I'm just doing my job, right? That's great. Um, <laughs> um, okay, let's see. Do, do, do. Yeah, so William makes another really good point. And now we're, you know, just talking about record access in general. It's worth checking Google for records. Depending on who owned the record, the record may be anywhere. Some of Britain's merchant records are held in Newfoundland, Canada. Newfoundland, Canada, for instance. Don't limit it to an area, but just go by keywords. You'll be surprised what turns up. I 100% agree. And that's actually something really important to remember about Percy and these publications as well, no matter how you access them. Um, it's important to remember that Percy is a keyword search, right? It's not necessarily a name search. There are names, but it's very limited. So it's a keyword search. So if I was looking at Percy for um, British merchants, I would look for the keywords merchant. Um, I would look for the keyword British. Um, I could limit it to just British publications, but I probably wouldn't on my initial initial search. Um, and then I would read through what comes back as my results and use the results of the search to inform my next search, right? Maybe merchant isn't the right keyword. Maybe I need to be more specific or more broad in order to get the, the results that I'm looking for. So use those keywords and use them creatively uh, so that you can have the best success. Do, do, do. Okay. So lots of people making suggestions about other contextual resources, Google Books, um, uh, the history, Family History Books on Family Search, another wonderful resource. Archive Grid is wonderful for those in the United States in particular. Internet Archive, of course, um, is a, uh, a, a fantastic one. I'll go back to, because Melissa, who is an archivist in Tennessee or Kentucky, don't recall exactly where Melissa is located, but um, I'm familiar with her work. She does some great uh, blog posts on how to use archives and what archives actually do for genealogists. Um, so she mentioned Archive Grid. Archive Grid is a product of WorldCat, um, and it was produced to basically help us find archives. So you could look up a topic like New York Catholic records, and you could filter and find which archives around the world have original records or manuscript collections of some kind um, that refer to New York Catholicism. Um, it is predominantly the United States and archives have to contribute their catalogs essentially to that source. So it's certainly not the only way to find an archive, but it is a great way to do it. Um, but it's, it's not kind of the end all be all, especially not um, for the United States. Um, a did qu a question, uh, Tennessee, thank you, Melissa. And her blog is a genealogist in the archives, if you're interested. Um, a, a question from our friends at Family History Fanatics. What kind of discoveries can folks find for African-American and enslaved persons in Percy? Um, and the answer to that is just lots. Um, <laughs> there are a number of publications, of course, that are uh, specific to African-American research from a number of African-American uh, societies across the United States in particular, um, and also societies uh, for people of African descent, no matter where they are in the world, whether they're in America or Britain or elsewhere. 
Um, and so the materials, of course, in those publications are really essential to that research. And Allen County Public Library happens to have a very large collection of African American research resources in addition to Percy. So um, using the two combined is actually really, really powerful. Um, so you might find a number of different topics. Um, so, you know, for example, I've been working a lot in the Revolutionary War period um, in the last few weeks. Um, you're going to find articles about how um, Southern colonists and plantation owners were very concerned about um, the British uh, kind of um, messing up the system of slavery from an economical standpoint. Um, they were very, very scared about that. So you're going to find articles that talk about that from a social history perspective and why some of those Southern plantation owners joined the revolution as patriots instead of loyalists because of that debate. Um, and so forth and so on, right? So the, the possibilities really are quite endless. Um, <laughs> so very good. Um, oh, and Michelle says, I'm looking at Trinidad articles on Percy right now. Fantastic, Michelle. Thank you. And good luck. Hope you find something really interesting um, to discover. That brings us to the top of the hour. Um, thank you all very much for being with us today. And we uh, really appreciate this journey through kind of the original genealogy community and the use of Percy as a tool. Again, if you have questions, feel free to send them in. Support at findmypast.com. Uh, if you have discoveries and stories that you want to share, uh, feel free to do that as well. We would love to hear from you. On Friday, Find My Past uh, Live uh, for Friday is going to be so good. So, so good. Um, tune in Friday for some really exciting new genealogy records. That is at 4 p.m. in the UK, 9 a.m. here in Mountain Time. That makes it 11 a.m. on the East Coast. Um, really, no matter where you are in the world, you're not going to want to miss Friday's Find My Past Friday. It's going to be so, so good. Um, I actually changed the dates of my vacation going on vacation next week instead of this week so that I wouldn't miss Friday. It's that, that big. All right. Uh, so keep that in mind. Um, we'll see you back on Friday. Thank you all once again for being here. Uh, we really appreciate that you're with us and that you're with us so consistently. We love you guys. Um, just one last, one last one to throw up there. Actually had no idea how to use Percy, so it's helped a lot. So I'm, I'm very glad to hear that. Please play around with it and, um, and make your discoveries. Um, I have joined the tease team. Absolutely. <laughs> We're all really excited about Friday. Okay. Um, take care of yourselves, take care of each other, and we will see you right back here on Friday. Thanks everybody and have a great day.